paper, we will discuss the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament foretold the coming of three prophets. We understand the first two of those to be John the Baptist and Jesus Christ leaving one unfulfilled prophecy. At the same time, when we read the New Testament, we find Jesus Christ foretelling one final prophet to follow at the conclusion of his ministry. And so again, the evidence for the foretelling of the final prophet is not just an Islamic evidence, it is also to be found in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments. So to begin with, I will give an introduction to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam episodes where we will discuss the evidences for his prophethood, for this is the crux of the matter. Can we validate the man Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a prophet or not? That will depend upon the evidence. So to begin with, Muhammad ibn Abdullah was born to the powerful tribe of the Quraysh in Mecca in or around the year 570 CE. His father died before he was born. His mother died when he was six years old. And he was raised by a Bedouin family who taught him caravan trading and sheep herding. He was known for certain qualities, even from childhood. He was known for ethics and honesty, gentleness, fairness, a very sober nature, he was known for having a deep contemplative spirituality, which only deepened and became more obvious as he matured. By the age of 40, he had secured a very comfortable life for himself. He was married to Khadija, a well-known and wealthy businesswoman. He had become himself wealthy, successful in society, a member of the powerful tribes in the Quraysh. He had children, wealth, high social standing. Yet, it was at this point that he started receiving revelation. And despite the wealth, the high social standing, the good position in which he lived, he basically went on to compromise everything that he had in a worldly sense to bear the message of revelation. He passed from this life in 632 CE. Now, it would be easy for me to project my opinion of the man Muhammad, peace be upon him, but what I would like to do over the next few minutes is read the opinions of others, historians, religious analysts, orientalists, and give you a flavor for their appreciation of Muhammad, peace be upon him. As I read these, understand that these are not the opinions of Muslims. These are the opinions of non-Muslims in most cases. In those cases where it is the opinion of a Muslim, I will identify it. But let us begin with Alexander Ross. No friend of the Islamic religion Alexander Ross was a declared anti-Islamic man. And yet, nonetheless, this is what he had to say. Quote, in speaking of Muhammad, quote, he did not pretend to deliver any new religion to them, but to revive the old one. 
which God gave first to Adam, and when lost in the corruption of the old world, restored it again by revelation to Abraham, who taught it his son Ishmael, their ancestor, and then he, when he settled first in Arabia, instructed men in the same. But their posterity degenerating into idolatry, God sent him now to destroy it and restore the religion of Ishmael. He allowed both of the Old and New Testament and that Moses and Christ were prophets sent from God. He allowed both of the Old and New Testament and that Moses and Christ were prophets sent from God. But that the Jews and Christians had corrupted these holy writings and that he was sent to purge them from those corruptions and to restore the law of God to that purity in which it was first delivered. The fact that Islam understands the previous prophets as just that, men as prophets, including Abraham, Moses, and Jesus Christ, but that at the same time Islam understands the Word of God to be represented in the Old and New Testaments, but that there is corruption to the Old and New Testaments as well. Hence the need for a final clarifying revelation conveyed by the final predicted prophet as encountered in the Old and New Testaments. Now, a somewhat longer description, but very worthwhile, simply because in reading this, I feel myself I could not say it any better. This was written over 200 years ago by Stanley Lane Poole in a time when it was dangerous, not just difficult, but actually dangerous for a man to express a positive opinion of Islam. In England, to express a positive opinion of Islam 200 years ago was to put your life on the line. And yet, this is what Stanley Lane Poole wrote. Quote, Muhammad was of middle height, rather thin but broad of shoulders, wide of chest, strong of bone and muscle. His head was massive, strongly developed. Dark hair, slightly curled, flowed in a dense mass almost to his shoulders. Even in advanced age, it was sprinkled with only about 20 gray hairs produced by the agonies of his revelations. His face was oval-shaped, slightly tawny of color. Fine, long, arched eyebrows were divided by a vein which throbbed visibly in moments of passion. Great black, restless eyes shone out from under long, heavy eyelashes. His nose was large, slightly aquiline. His teeth, upon which he bestowed great care, were well-set, dazzling white. A full beard framed his manly face. His skin was clear and soft, his complexion red and white. His hands were as silk and satin, even as those of a woman. His step was quick and elastic, yet firm as that of one who steps from a high to a low place. In turning his face, he would also turn his whole body. His whole gait and presence was dignified and imposing. His countenance was mild and pensive. His laugh was rarely more than a smile. Stanley Lane Poole goes from a description of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his habits. Quote, in his habits, he was extremely simple. Though he bestowed great care on his person, his eating and drinking, his dress and his furniture retained, even when he had reached the fullness of power, their almost primitive nature. The only luxuries he indulged in were, besides arms, which he highly prized, a pair of yellow boots, a present from the Negus of Abyssinia. Perfumes, however, he loved passionately, being most sensitive to smells. Strong drink he abhorred. He was gifted with mighty powers of imagination, elevation of mind, delicacy and refinement of feeling. He is more modest than a virgin behind her curtain, it was said of him. He was most indulgent to his inferiors and would never allow his awkward little page to be scolded whatever he did.
Ten years, said Anas, his servant, was I about the prophet, and he never said as much as uff to me. He was very affectionate towards his family. One of his boys died on his breast in the smoky house of the nurse, a blacksmith's wife. He was very fond of children. He would stop them in the streets and pat their heads. He never struck anyone in his life. The worst expression he ever made use of in conversation was, what has come to him? May his forehead be darkened with mud. When asked to curse someone, he replied, I have not been sent to curse, but to be a mercy to mankind. He visited the sick, followed any funeral bier he met, accepted the invitation of a slave to dinner, mended his own clothes, milked the goats, and waited upon himself. Related summarily another tradition, he goes on, he never first withheld his hand out of another man's palm and turned not before the other had turned. He was the most faithful protector of those he protected, the sweetest and most agreeable in conversation. Those who saw him were immediately, suddenly filled with reverence. Those who came near him loved him. Those who described him would say, I have never seen his like either before or after. He was of great taciturnity. But when he spoke, it was with emphasis and deliberation, and no one could ever forget what he said. I will continue with another opinion, not from one of his friends, but from one of his enemies. George Sale, one of the early translators of the Holy Quran, hated Islam and hated the man Muhammad. And yet, this is what he had to say about him. Quote, for however criminal Muhammad may have been in imposing a false religion on mankind, now is there any doubt that this man hates Muhammad and Islam? We learn the vehemence of his hatred from his words, and yet see how he continues. The praises to his real virtues ought not to be denied him, nor can I do otherwise than applaud the candor of the pious and learned Spanhemius, who though he owned him to have been a wicked impostor. Now these are his enemies, the worst of his enemies, and yet, they say, yet acknowledged him to have been richly furnished with natural endowments, beautiful in his person, of a subtle wit, agreeable behavior, showing liberality to the poor, courtesy to everyone, fortitude against his enemies, and above all, a high reverence for the name of God. Severe against the perjured, adulterers, murderers, flanderers, covetous, false witnesses, etc. A great preacher of patience, charity, mercy, beneficence, gratitude, honoring of parents, and superiors, and a frequent celebrator of the divine praises. And deeth are the words of his enemy. So we see in this a true picture of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that if your enemies speak well of you, how can there be any bad to you? In a hadith in which Ali ibn Abi Talib the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave a description that is well respected. Quote, he was not vulgar, nor did he condone vulgarity. And he was not one to shout in the marketplace. He did not reward evil with evil, rather he would forgive and overlook. He never in his life struck anything with his hand except when he was fighting in the name of Allah. He never struck a servant nor a woman and I never saw him take revenge for an injustice dealt him, except if the prohibitions of Allah were transgressed. For if the prohibitions of Allah were transgressed, he was among the strongest of them in anger. He was never given a choice between two matters, but he chose the simplest of the two. If he entered into his home, he was a man like any other.
cleaning his own garment, milking his own goat, and serving himself. He was continually smiling, gentle in manners, soft in nature. He was not severe, hard-hearted, loud, abusive, or miserly. He would disregard that which he disliked, and no one ever despaired of him. He never responded to disparagement or evil words. He forbade himself three things, argument, arrogance, and that which did not concern him. And he relieved the people of three. He would not degrade any among them or abuse them. He would not search after their honor or private matters. And he would not speak except in matters which he hoped to be rewarded for. When he spoke, his attendees would lower their heads as if birds had lighted upon them. Once he finished, they would speak. They would not vie with one another in his presence to speak, but when one would talk in his presence, the rest would listen until he finished. Speech in his presence was that of the first among them. He would laugh with them and wonder with them. He had patience with the strangers when they were gruff in speech and requests, to a degree that his companions would fetch them to him. He would say, if you see someone in need, fetch him to me. He would not accept praise except from those who were balanced and not excessive. He would not interject into someone's speech unless they transgressed, in which case he would either rebuke them or else leave. In another hadith related by Bukhari and Muslim, quote, he was the most generous of heart, truthful of tongue, softest in disposition, and noble in relationship. The English archaeologist and scholar D.G. Hogarth wrote as follows. Serious or trivial, serious or trivial, his daily behavior has instituted a canon which millions observe at this day with conscious mimicry. No one regarded by any section of the human race as perfect man has been imitated so minutely. The conduct of the founder of Christianity has not so governed the ordinary life of his followers. Moreover, no founder of a religion has been left on so solitary an eminence as the Muslim apostle. And this is exactly in accordance with what we described earlier in one of my talks in which I described how we find the example of Jesus, peace be upon him, his example better exemplified in the appearance, the manners, the practices of worship and the creed among the practices of the Muslims than among the practices of those who consider themselves Christian. And yet in both cases, it is the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is most closely exemplified, most closely emulated among his followers. His character was well documented by Washington Irving. Quote, he was sober and abstemious in his diet and a rigorous observer of fasts. He indulged in no magnificence of apparel the ostentation of a petty mind. Neither was his simplicity in dress affected, but the result of a real disregard to distinction from so trivial a source. His military triumphs awakened no pride, no vainglory, as they would have done had they been affected for selfish purposes. In the time of his greatest power, he maintained the same simplicity of manners and appearance as in the days of his adversity. So far from affecting regal state, he was displeased if, upon entering a room, any unusual testimony of respect were shown him. If he aimed at universal dominion, it was the dominion of the faith. As to the temporal rule, which grew up in his hands, as he used it without ostentation, so he took no step to perpetuate it in his family. The riches which poured in upon him from tribute and the spoils of war were expended in promoting the victories of the faith and in relieving the poor among its votaries, insomuch that his treasury was often drained of its last coin. What is he saying? He is saying all the wealth 
that came from the position of his office, he distributed to the poor and needy, and others who would benefit. Omar ibn al-Harith declares that Muhammad at his death did not leave a golden dinar nor a silver dirham, a slave nor a slave girl, nor anything but his gray mule, his arms, and the ground which he bestowed upon his wives, his children, and the poor. Allah, says the Arabian writer, offered him the keys of all the treasures of the earth but he refused to accept them. And so we find in this the example of a very human messenger described both by his friends, companions, and allies, but also by his enemies. The point being that his attributes were undeniable. For now, I will close this segment with a description from Hind. Quote, the messenger of Allah was of consecutive sorrows, continuous thought, never finding rest long in silence. He did not speak without cause. He spoke with his full mouth, in other words, was not arrogant, and spoke concisely. His speech was just with neither excess nor deficiency. He was not pompous nor denigrating. He exalted all blessings, no matter how small, and never belittled a single one. And with that, I would like to conclude this section 
And we were discussing the character of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we concluded that we would follow with, which is dedicating to discussing the evidences for Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam having been the true prophet that he claimed to be. Now, when we are talking about the miracles that surround a prophet, miracles be divided into two types those miracles that occur around the prophet peace be upon him as evidence of his prophethood and those miracles which are channeled through his person in other words miracles performed by the will of Allah through that person and these are the first two evidences of the prophethood of Muhammad peace be upon him other evidences include his character his persistence and steadfastness, the lack of disqualifiers, and the Prophet's maintenance of the message. And we will address all. So to begin with, we are going to start by discussing the first category of miracles, those miracles which surround a person as evidence of their prophethood, as evidence of divine favor upon them. What are some examples of such kind of miracles. Well, Allah saving Daniel from the lions, saving Jonah from the whale, Abraham from the fire, Moses from Pharaoh, certainly the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Now, many Westerners, many who are not familiar with the Islamic religion, should be reminded that at the birth of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was a miracle of a star as well. According to Hassan ibn Thabit, the legendary Muslim poet, he was in Medina, over 200 miles away from Mecca, when Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. No way at that time for the message to have been transmitted from Mecca to Medina at that time. And yet, on the day that Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was born, he heard a Jew screaming at the top of his voice, quote, O oh my Jewish community, tonight the star of Ahmed, meaning the foretold prophet Muhammad, in which he was a born upon, has arisen. When you look at the later life of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we find miracles such as the fact that there were multiple attempts upon his life. Now, you have to forgive me for skipping a lot. This subject has books written upon it, and it cannot be covered in one discussion. So I am jumping from his birth to his adulthood. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was bearing the message of revelation, there were those who hated him and wished death upon him. In one case, an unbeliever accosted him with the sword of the Prophet, which he had snatched while the Prophet ﷺ was sleeping. And when he threatened him with the sword and said, Who will save you now? The Prophet ﷺ replied, Allah. At that moment, the disbeliever's hand became paralyzed, and he could not hold the sword, and he dropped it. In another relation, Abu Jahl, declared his intention to crush Muhammad's head while he was praying in prostration. He picked up a boulder and advanced towards him while he was praying, intending to crush his head. He was repelled by the vision of a vicious camel, which nobody else could see, and retreated, declaring the vision of this vicious camel that to everybody else's eyes was not there. Similarly, Abu Lahab's wife once went with a handful of stones to stone the prophet. And she found his companion, Abu Bakr,
sitting, and she asked him about the whereabouts of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, intending to go and stone him. Well, in fact, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sitting immediately beside Abu Bakr. They were sitting next to one another. But whereas she could see Abu Bakr, Allah blinded her eyes to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Intending to go and stone him, she could not see him, she could not find him. In other traditions, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was informed either by miracle or by the angel of revelation, Gabriel, of plots to kill him by poison, by pushing him off a mountainside, and by crushing him with a boulder dropped from a height. In all cases, the plots were true. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was able to avoid them and by so doing remain alive. What is interesting about these stories is two things. One is there was never a false alarm. In a time when Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had every reason to believe that everybody was out to kill him for in fact many were he did not declare any false plots upon his life. The only times that he identified a plot against his life was when there actually was one. The other thing that is interesting about this scenario is that despite all of these attempts upon his life, when a true prophet or anybody in public position whose life is threatened has every reason to begin to get a little bit paranoid, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he released his bodyguards. Now why would anybody do something like this? Something we would conceive to be almost crazy. People are trying to kill you. They've made multiple, multiple attempts and you release your bodyguards. Who in their right mind would do this if not a prophet? For he received revelation stating, quote, Allah will defend you from men who mean mischief. So he understood this as a promise from Allah to protect him and released his bodyguards upon the strength of this promise. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam planned the emigration from Mecca to Medina, a crowd, a mob of assassins surrounded his home. The intention was that they would kill him together en masse so that no one person would be blamed with the murder, but the blame would be distributed among all of the tribes. What did he do? He supplicated to Allah, he recited Quran, he walked out of his house, and he walked through their midst, and not a single person saw him. In this way, because Allah had confused the assassins and blinded their eyes to his presence, he was able to walk out of his house and out of Mecca and begin the emigration to Medina. And en route to Medina, they were chased by all of Quraysh, who had been offered a reward for their return. Surqa ibn Malik, one of the famed warriors, hungry for this reward, came upon them with his horse and charged at them. But as he approached, the horse stumbled and fell and threw him. He cast lots or cast arrows, as was the habit of the pagan Arabs of that time. And he found the signs were not positive. But he was still so hungry for the reward, he got back on his horse, tried to charge again. The horse tripped again and threw him. He was a renowned horseman. For him to have been thrown by the horse was something very, very unusual, but it happened not only twice, he did it again, and he was thrown a third time. And it was so impressive upon him that he stopped within shouting distance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam promised them, promised Surqa ibn Malik, that if he would turn back from his pursuit, one day he would wear the crown and the bracelets of the emperor of Persia. Now, we have to remember, 
for anybody but a prophet, this would have been a wild prophecy, a wild foretelling. Persia was one of the great world powers of the time. Persia was on the brink of being the major power of the time throughout the world. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and his small band of followers are emigrating, escaping persecution from the Quraysh, running to Medina for a place where they could live as a small band to promise that somehow in the future Surqa ibn Malik would be able to wear the crown and the bracelets of the emperor of Persia was not just a bold promise. For anybody but a prophet, it would have been considered insane. And yet this is exactly how it happened. Surqa ibn Malik, although a disbeliever, like the other enemies of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, knew him for his exemplary character. They could not deny his character, although they did deny the revelation. And even the enemies of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew him as a sadaq al amin the truthful, the trustworthy. And so based upon these words from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as crazy they might have sounded coming from anybody else, Surqa ibn Malik turned around and went away, returned to Mecca. And sure enough, many years later, after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had passed from his worldly existence, the Muslims did defeat the major world power of Persia. And Surqa ibn Malik did wear the crown and the bracelets of the Chosros, the emperor of Persia. And so this most unlikely prophecy came true another powerful evidence for the prophethood of Muhammad, peace be upon him. At the Battle of Badr, the Muslims were outnumbered four to one. The Quraysh had a cavalry. The Muslims did not. The Quraysh had mail and armor, basically, to protect their bodies. The Muslims did not. The Quraysh not only outnumbered them, but had strength in weapons, and strength in their own protection in the form of this male. All the same, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he saw their army at a distance, he took a handful of earth and threw it at them, saying, confusion sees their faces. Immediately, a storm, a desert storm, stirred up, causing confusion in the ranks of the enemy. The battle ensued. The Muslims were victorious. Remember, the enemy outnumbered the Muslims four to one. At the conclusion of the battle, the dead of the enemy outnumbered the Muslims five to one, exactly the opposite from what you would expect. If the enemies outnumbered the Muslims, you would expect more dead among the Muslims than among the superior force. It was exactly opposite. The Muslims were victorious. The vast army of the Quraysh was put into retreat, and Allah revealed, quote, when you threw, meaning this handful of dust that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam threw, when you threw it was not your act, but Allah's. Maysara, Muhammad's caravan companion, related that while they were on caravan, he noted that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was shaded by clouds which followed him. Bahira, a Nestorian monk, is recorded to have identified Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the final foretold prophet by a birthmark on his back, which he identified as the seal of prophethood. And he made this identification when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a child traveling with the caravan. Perhaps the greatest miracle, or I should say one of the greatest because there were so many, that occurred during the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to identify him as a prophet was al-Isra wal-Maraj, the journey and the ascension. The story of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam having been mystically transported 
from Mecca to Jerusalem by a horse, a flying horse, through the air, ascending through the heavens, descending again, and traveling back to Mecca all in one night. Quite obviously, when he told of this journey, people were speculative. They had understandable consternation. However, when they asked him, since he had allegedly traveled to Jerusalem, to describe Jerusalem for their benefit, even though he had never been there, he described it to all who had been there, and they identified that, in fact, he could only be giving a description as one who had seen it with their own eyes. In addition, in transit, on the trip back at night, he had traveled in the sky, and so he had passed a caravan two days distant from Mecca, two days distant from Mecca. No way by any other means to know of this caravan at that place in time. He described the caravan to the Quraysh. He described the people. He described the animals. He described the events. So all of these are miraculous events occurring around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as indications of his prophethood. Now let's move on to miracles that were performed by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by the will of Allah. This is a long list. Again, books have been written about this subject alone. I will only encapsulize the issues. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa through invoking the blessings of Allah, was known to have brought milk to the udders of dry sheep. He was known to have energized camels that were too weary to walk, and they would become the fastest among them. He was known to have fed and watered the masses with minuscule quantities. He was known to have done other miracles such as healing, such as transforming a stick of wood into a sword for a soldier who needed one, etc. Scores of hungry poor were fed from a bowl of milk judged sufficient for one. When they looked at the bowl, it looked like it was enough only for one person. And yet, when he invoked blessings over it, everybody drank from it, scores of people drank from it, and it was not depleted. An army numbering over a thousand was fed from a measure of flour and a little pot of meat so small that it was thought sufficient for only ten people. This was at the Battle of the Trench. In another case, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa gathered the mixed foodstuffs of an army of 1,400. It came to a few handfuls of mixed foodstuffs. He invoked Allah's blessings over it. 1,400 people ate from it, filled their stomachs, and there was so much left over that they filled their saddlebags as well. From a few handfuls of foodstuff, 1,400 were fed and filled their saddlebags. On another occasion, an army of 1,400 men ran out of water. They only had a very small quantity of water, a few handfuls. Again, he invoked blessings over it, and it became enough water to water them, it became enough water for everyone to perform ablution. In the same way, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam exercised spirits, healed the broken leg of Abdullah ibn Atiq, he healed the war-wounded leg of Salama, he healed the inflamed eye of Ali, the bleeding wound of another man, the poisonous sting to Abu Bakr's foot, and restored the vision to a blind man. When the people were suffering from drought, he prayed for rain, and it rained. When the rain continued too long, they asked him. He prayed for the rain to be around us, but not upon us, whereupon the rain divided, and instead of being upon them, surrounded them for their comfort and to prevent the damage from the downpour. Many times he received revelation that proved prophetic. One very interesting point about this, he never received a prophecy in Revelation, but that it came true. One thing that we know about those who prophesy is that 
Some things may come true, but there is a great deal that does not. What should we say about somebody who presents himself as a prophet, as a messenger to mankind, and every single thing that is ever revealed to him as revelation comes true? This is a very strong evidence to the sincerity, the honesty of the man, and the divine nature of his appointment, prophethood. One example of one of these prophetic revelations was when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was visited by some messengers from Persia. He informed them upon their arrival that the emperor of Persia, their emperor, had died during their absence. In fact, he had been murdered. They returned to Yemen where they were met with a letter informing them of the fact that indeed the emperor of Persia had been murdered. The governor of Yemen and his followers accepted Islam on this evidence alone for there was no possible way that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Mecca in the Arabian desert could possibly have known that the emperor of Persia had been murdered except through the path of revelation. Similarly, a false prophet, al-Aswad al-Ansi, was killed in Yemen one day before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died. Nonetheless, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was visited by al-Aswad's delegates at that time and he informed them of al-Aswad's demise, the fact that al-Aswad had been killed in Yemen. And again, there was no possible way this information could have reached him. Remember that at this time, information was transmitted by trading caravans. It took weeks or months to travel from one place to another. And yet, Al-Aswad was killed one day before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died. He informed Al-Aswad's delegates and when they returned, they found out that the information was true. The most impressive to many people was the miracle of the splitting of the moon. When the Quraysh asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for a sign of his prophethood, he pointed to the moon, they looked up, and the moon split in two. Well, it's a powerful story. Of course, it's a relatively undeniable sign. As the Red Sea, as Allah could divide the Red Sea for Moses, the tradition is that he divided the moon for Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are a few of the many, many miracles which occurred around the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or were conducted by him by the will of Allah. Now let's move on to another category by which we can provide evidence for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that is an analysis of his character. If we close our eyes and think about Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, what do you see? Probably not very much. We do not have much in biblical scripture to inform us about these prophets. And yet, we know them for what they were. But we do not know a great deal about them. When we hear stories about certain of the prophets, many of these stories do not jibe with our expectations. The story of Noah getting drunk and stripping himself naked and falling down unconscious naked from his drunkenness. The story of Lot committing incest with his daughters, albeit drunk at the time. The story of Jesus cursing the fig tree, degrading the Gentiles, and rebuking his mother. The story of Judah committing fornication. The story of David committing murder out of his lust for Bathsheba, arranging for her husband to be sent to his death. These stories do not jibe with our expectations of what a prophet would be like. So when we ask ourselves, 
questions like, well, what was Abraham like? It is a little disconcerting that we cannot form a strong opinion because we do not have enough information to know what they looked like, how they acted, what they did, what they even taught in many cases. And yet, we find in the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, traditions and historical descriptors that make him clear in all of these aspects. In particular, his piety is well described by both his followers and his enemies. Let me read a description from the New International Encyclopedia. Quote, the essential sincerity of his, referring to Muhammad, of his nature cannot be questioned. And a historical criticism that blinks no fact, yields nothing to credulity, weighs every testimony, has no partisan interest, and seeks only the truth, must acknowledge his claim to belong to that order of prophets who, whatever the nature of their physical experience may have been, in diverse times and in diverse manners, have admonished, taught, uttered austere and sublime thoughts, laid down principles of conduct nobler than those they found, and devoted themselves fearlessly to their higher calling, being irresistibly impelled to their ministry by a power within. We find that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was devoted to the message he claimed as revelation. He was a simple man. He lived in single room, mud brick apartments, slept on a rough leather mat stuffed with palm fiber. He ate whatever was available through times of hardship and partook of unrefined foods only in moderation during times of plenty. There were many occasions when he had nothing to eat but dates and water, sometimes for months. He prayed two-thirds of the night, fasted in all seasons, and gave away any gifts or profits to the poor or in the name of the religion. Generosity was legendary, his manners exemplary, his comportment inspiring. He died as he lived, a pauper. He was known to have milked his own goat, he mended his own clothes, cobbled his own shoes, served his family in their home, attended to the poor and ailing. When manual labor was called for, he carried two stones where everybody else carried one. When the Masjid Kuba was constructed, he was the first to lay stones. At the Battle of the Trench, when the companions were unable to prevail over a boulder in digging the trench, he took up the digging tools and by invoking the name of Allah, demolished the boulder. At the Battle of Uhud, he was challenged to soul battle. His companions offered to fight in his stead. He refused, faced the challenger alone, and was victorious. And you know what? These stories go on, and they go on, and they go on far longer than we have time for, unfortunately. Once again, I would like to quote from a book from which you would not expect to find such a positive quote, the New Catholic Encyclopedia. For once again, if we find the truth among those who would be most likely to oppose Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we must respect it. Quote, his adversaries, among whom were many Jews and Christians, watched eagerly for indications of fraud. And Muhammad was able successfully to assume a remarkable self-assured attitude toward any accusations of that sort. Read between the lines. What is the New Catholic Encyclopedia telling us? that the Jews and the Christians watched eagerly for indications of fraud and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, quote, was able successfully to assume a remarkable self-assured attitude toward any accusations of that sort. In other words, they looked for fraud 
they never found it. I'm going to continue by moving on to the evidence of his persistence and steadfastness. In particular, it is well documented that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was persistent against all levels of adversity. His believers were ostracized, they were assaulted, they were tortured, and at times they were murdered. In the case of Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, he was threatened, humiliated, beaten, stoned, driven out of his home and his city. His beloved wife, Khadija, died while they were in forced exile. And yet, despite all of this, and despite the frequent attempts upon his life, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood in prayer at night until his body rebelled. On one occasion, in the Holy Quran, Surah 58, Ayat 2, Allah revealed that he forgave Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for his sins, past, present, and future. And yet, what did he do? What would anybody do? What would anybody who has been told by Allah, by our Creator, of the promise of Jannah, the promise of Paradise, who has been informed that their sins have been forgiven, past, present, and future. What would that person do? Well, I think we all know the vast majority of mankind would throw a party of, dare I say, biblical proportions. But the point is that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not do this. He did not lower his level of worship. In fact, he continued his level of worship as it was, to the point where one of his wives asked him, hasn't God forgiven you that which is before you and that which is behind you? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, should I not be a thankful servant? Should these not be the words of a prophet? In fact, are these not the words of nothing but a prophet? Who else bearing the forgiveness of their sins, past, present, and future, would continue their worship unaltered, simply out of love of their Creator, simply out of love of their Creator and thankfulness for the blessings He has bestowed upon them. The example of a man? No. Men hearing this message would, even if they did not want to, they would not be able to help it. They would lower their level of worship. They would relax because they would have a feeling that they made it. They succeeded. They have the promise of Jannah. They have the promise of paradise. But this is not the example that we find with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. On one occasion, someone called the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O best of mankind. How would a charlatan respond? Somebody who is trying to fool his followers when told, O oh, best of mankind. Oh, yes. <clears throat> well, thank you. No, that's not what he said. He said that was Ibrahim. Peace be upon him. He diverted praise from himself to others. On one occasion, a man said, quote, God and you, O Muhammad, have willed this in reference to a certain matter. And Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rebuked him because he saw this man as setting him up as partners with God. In fact, he said, have you made me equal with God? Now, we find other quotations. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stressed the distinction between God and his prophets by teaching, quote, do not overpraise me as the Christians overpraised Jesus, the son of Mary, for I am only his meaning God's servant, so say Allah's servant and messenger. We have a very striking story in the story of Muhammad's son, Ibrahim. Ibrahim died as an infant, and on the day of his death, there was a solar eclipse. There was an eclipse of the sun.
And the people began to say, oh, the sun has eclipsed for the death of Ibrahim. Now, again, I ask you to put yourself in the situation. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was preaching the message of revelation, hoping to gather a following. When the people started to say that the sun has eclipsed for the death of Ibrahim, Muhammad's son, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his son, does it not make sense that a charlatan would say, oh yes, well, <coughs> absolutely, yes, that's, that is certainly what makes sense. Uh, I mean, God himself mourns the death of my son. And while we're talking about it, please, would everybody care to donate? That's what a man would do. That's what a charlatan would do. That is not what Muhammad did, peace be upon him. No, Muhammad declared, verily, the sun and the moon are two signs of the signs of Allah. They do not eclipse for the death of anyone, nor for his birth. So if you see that an eclipse, then supplicate to God, reverence his name, pray, and give charity. Again, he could have used this event to build up his following, to deceive them. He could have used it as a ploy, but he didn't. He recognized it for what it was, demoted his significance in the eyes of the people in the way that he demoted his significance in the eyes of the people throughout his life, only recognizing himself as Allah's servant and messenger. In fact, even when he lay dying, he instructed his followers not to take his grave as a site of worship. So, another quotation that illustrates his humility, quote, say, I tell you not with me are the treasures of Allah, nor do I know what is hidden, nor do I tell you I am an angel. I but follow what is revealed to me. That is from the Holy Quran 650. In 3, 144, we read, quote, Muhammad is no more than a messenger. Would Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have revealed verses that stress his humanity, stress the fact that he is no more than a messenger? Would he have revealed that if he were a charlatan? Remember that this was a time when people worshiped stones. This was a time when people embraced false prophets. This was a time 600 years after the time when the Christians had deified Jesus. Would they have accepted Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a god if he had set himself up as a god? Absolutely. But he did not. And he was very careful, as you would expect of a true messenger, of a true prophet of God. He was very careful to save the distinction of divinity for God and for God alone and to clarify the fact that he was nothing more than a man and a messenger. Now, in the case of Mecca, when the Muslims returned to Mecca victorious, taking back Mecca, the city where they had been beaten, the city where they had been persecuted, the city where they had been separated from their wives and their homes, cast out in humiliation, the city that had killed their loved ones, the city that had taken from them their very honor, the city that had killed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's favored uncle Hamza, and on the battlefield, the Quraysh, one of them had actually opened his body, cut his body open, and cut his liver and chewed his liver. When they returned after 20 years of persecution to have victory over the city, what did they do? What did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam direct them to do? Imagine being in this position where you have been humiliated, beaten, tortured, your followers have been killed. You yourself have suffered every disgrace possible at these people's hands and now you have the upper hand. What would you do? And yet, what did he do? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not take the viewpoint we would expect. It was a time when the conquerors would sever the heads of the men, stack them in the marketplace as a trophy, rape and enslave the women, 
and enslave the children as well. We saw none of that in his example. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked the people what they expected. They asked for mercy and he gave it. In a bloodless takeover, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forgave the population of Mecca despite all the horrors that they had committed in the past for 20 years. 20 years of suffering and he forgave it. There were a handful of evil men whose evil was so great that they needed either to be exiled, but only out of these 10, four were executed for their crimes. And in the times in which this occurred, that was such a merciful act, the people almost could not believe it. But they were so impressed that they accepted Islam en masse, even though it was not forced upon them. There is no compulsion in religion, and the people accepted Islam not out of compulsion, but having seen the beauty of this man's mercy in a situation where they understood themselves, as I'm sure you understand, considering how you would act in the same situation, they understood that this was not a level of mercy that could be expected of any man, but a level of mercy that could only have come from a prophet. That concludes this section. A lot of people reject the message of Islam because they don't like the message itself. It's not a matter of not liking the messenger, but not liking the message. One of the things that we find in the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the revelation that he revealed is that it is anything but a man's religion. Many object on the basis of saying, oh, this is a man's religion. You can marry as many as four wives. You can basically do the things that men like to do. This religion gives you that power. I'm really wondering, where have they studied Islam? Again, we are talking in this section on the lack of disqualifiers. Basically, the things that we would expect to find in a charlatan, but do not find in the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the society in which Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived, gambling was rampant, drunkenness was a normal social activity, licentiousness was you know, looked up to rather than down upon. People feasted with abandon. Um, laziness was a, an attribute of the higher class, etc. The qualities that people like are the same qualities that the revelation either forbade or curtailed. Gambling was forbidden. Alcohol became forbidden. Women could no longer be misused as they had been misused as prostitutes, but rather they had to be given their rights and respected in marriage. 1400 years before Western society recognized women's rights to property and inheritance to vote and to religion, Islam recognized women's right to those things. This was a huge social reform. If you think it's unpopular now, imagine how unpopular it was 1400 years ago. And yet this was the revelation that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conveyed. He conveyed a revelation that curtailed or forbade the excesses and sins of his time and put mankind on a pathway of piety and respectability. Is this the example of a man who is driven by his desires? when he is revealing a revelation that basically curtail or forbid what most men like to do? Or is this the example of a prophet bearing the message of Allah? To continue, I would like to analyze more of these objections, but the fact of the matter is that with pretty much every section that I have discussed, we simply don't have the time to go through it all, and so I have to recommend to the audience, if you would like to look into this deeper, Please read my book, Godded, or the book preceding it, Misguided. For this section, I am quoting from Godded, 
And both of these books can be found on my website, leveltruth.com. As I mentioned earlier, one of the objections was that there is a passage in the Holy Quran, 48.2, which states that Allah forgave Muhammad wasalam, for his sins. Some look at the statement and say, okay, well, so Muhammad had sins. Uh, well, so what? First of all, they were minor and they were extremely few, maybe in the category of misjudgments, but um, isn't this, again, the quality of a human being? Would a false prophet reveal a revelation that recognizes his sins? False prophets paint themselves as perfect. This revelation recognized that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had sins and he was the one who conveyed the revelation. Do sins negate a person's prophethood? Of course not. But if we are going to say that sins negate a person's prophethood, we have to cast out Abraham and Ishmael, Isaiah, Noah, Moses. And obviously we cannot do that. So the possibility or the recognition, I should say, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had sins is something you would expect of a prophet. Why? Because he's conveying a revelation and he has to convey it as it is revealed. He might receive a verse like this that he would like to hide because it acknowledges his sins, but as a prophet, he is duty bound to add it to the revelation. Another point is that in the Bible, we find Luke 15, 7 saying, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. In fact, this indicates that the person who repents creates more joy in heaven than the person who never went astray to begin with. We find that in the principles of the Jewish faith, that Moses was conceived the greatest of the prophets. In Christianity, Jesus Christ was elevated to the level of divinity. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could just as easily made such claims, and yet he consistently denied divinity and attributed it for himself, his humanity and his prophethood. Instead, he transmitted a revelation that proclaimed as follows, we believe in Allah and the revelation given to us and to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and that given to Moses and Jesus, and that given to all prophets from their Lord, we make no difference between one and another of them, and we bow to Allah in Islam. So, if we are to pursue the consideration of this subject, we have to remember that Muhammad's example was one of temperance. He was not a voluptuary. He was not seeking the pleasure of women. Had he been so, number one, he could have had these things without the revelation because that 
was the social standard of his time. Number two, he was offered the wealth of the Quraysh, their kingship and their chieftainship. So he could have elevated himself to that position simply by receiving their offer. However, he denied it for the sake of transmitting his message of revelation. Yes, he had multiple marriages. Are they an example of licentiousness? No. Let us remember that he married for practical reasons. Through his marriages, he cemented intertribal ties, he sheltered orphaned widows and divorcees, and he demonstrated Islamic marital limits. He did not do what you would expect a leader to do. He did not handpick the choicest maidens of the realm and assemble a harem of the most beautiful uh, women of his time. No, only one of his wives, Aisha, was a virgin. The remainder were either divorced or older or a combination thereof. Maimuna was 51 years old when he married her, but she was young enough to be Umm Salama's child because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married Umm Salama. Zainab was divorced from a freed slave, which was a social stigma that was almost unthinkable of at the time, and yet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her. In a time when other leaders were setting up rules such as the right of the Lord, the droit de seigneur, which allowed the lord of a feudal realm to bed the wives of his vassals on their wedding night, at a time when people were running amok in licentiousness, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did the exact opposite. He exemplified temperance. Yes, he had multiple wives, but for practical reasons. Is that in the Bible we find he had fewer wives than Solomon, less transgression than David, who was recorded as having arranged the death of Bathsheba's husband out of lust for Bathsheba. More restraint than Judah, who is recorded as having had an incestuous affair with Tamar. Why? Because he thought she was a prostitute, which in and of itself would have been bad enough. Better than all of these examples is the example of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not to speak poorly of Solomon or David or Judah, but rather to suggest that if you take those examples as the examples of prophets or patriarchs, you have to recognize the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to have been superior to the example of the polygamy of Solomon, the licentiousness or the licentious story, whether true or not, of David and that of Judah, who, according to the story, was willing to contract a prostitute. So I will conclude by saying that, yes, Islam permits polygamy within limits, as polygamy was permitted in the Old Testament. And we know that, although it was not expressly permitted in the New Testament, most certainly it was not forbidden. I just want to conclude by saying that as polygamy is permitted in the Holy Quran, it is limited to four, and there are limits placed upon the relationship and the rights of women. We have to remember that the Old Testament permitted polygamy. It was only outlawed amongst Ashkenazi Jews in the year 1000. It was only outlawed in Israel in 1950. So. The fact of the matter is that the Old Testament recognized and permitted polygamy without limit. In the same way, the New Testament did not specifically condone polygamy, but on the other hand, it did not forbid it. We have been discussing the evidences for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the revelation that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam conveyed for the first time in history um, required women to be respected and gave them their rights. They had to be married with necessary formality. And 1,300 years before the developed West gave women their rights to inheritance, their rights to property, their rights to wealth, their rights to religion,
Islam gave these rights to women in the 600s when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa revealed the revelation of the Holy Quran. Another point that should be made is that even until this time, the church debates about whether or not women have souls. And yet Islam recognized that women had souls equal to men. And this recognition was 1400 years ago. To this day, it remains behind closed doors because it is a politically sensitive issue. But the church still debates over whether or not women have souls. So I will conclude this uh, category of the evidence with Thomas Carlyle's quotation as thus, quote, Muhammad himself, after all that can be said about him, was not a sensual man. We shall err widely if we consider this man as a common voluptuary intent mainly on base enjoyments, nay, on enjoyments of any kind. His household was of the frugalist, his common diet, barley bread and water. Sometimes for months there was not a fire once lighted on his hearth. They record with just pride that he would mend his own clothes, patch his own cloak. A poor, hard-toiling, ill-provided man, careless of what vulgar men toil for. Vulgar in Old English meaning common. Careless of what vulgar or common men toil for. Not a bad man, I should say, something better in him than hunger of any sort. For these wild Arab men fighting and jostling three and twenty years at his hand in close contact with him always would not have reverenced him so. They were wild men, bursting ever and anon into quarrel, into all kinds of fierce sincerity, without right worth and manhood, no man could have commanded him. And yet, command him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did, and he did so through his character and through conveying a revelation that he did not compromise for the base enjoyments of this life. The next category in this discussion is maintenance of message, meaning that we expect to find in the example of a prophet the maintenance of the core message of what it means to be a person of God. Again, we are discussing the evidences for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I submit that one of the evidences is that he maintained the message of truth in Revelation. To understand this, we have to remember that the core message of Revelation truly never changed. Islamic monotheism teaches that God is one. We find, if we step back, we find in the Old Testament, we find the first commandment is to recognize the unity of God. We find in the New Testament that Jesus Christ is asked three places about the greatest commandment and he states, Know, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. The Trinity is not based on the teachings of Jesus Christ. The Trinity was a derived doctrine, derived from extra-biblical sources, and attributed to the foundational teachings of Paul and Pauline theologians. The teaching of the prophet Jesus was the teaching of Tawheed, of the oneness of God. We find in three places in the Bible he spoke of the oneness of God and never spoke of the Trinity. Charges which you can find, again, explained in far greater detail either in earlier sessions of these talks or in my book, Misguided. So, the essential creed, in other words, never changed. The laws taught by Moses and Jesus were transmitted with little variation. Little variation? That's a concerning phrase, isn't it? Little variation means that there were some changes, and indeed there were. In the time of Moses and Jesus, alcohol may have been permitted, and in the Islamic religion it was forbidden. And there were other changes as well, 
few and albeit small, but significant changes such as the abolition of the Sabbath. However, we have to consider whether this makes sense in the scheme of Revelation. Because in fact, we find the example of abrogation, the example in which God changed his laws according to time and circumstance. For example, God initially permitted the sons and daughters of Adam to marry. It was a necessity. The human race sprung from their ancestry. But this, of course, was later recognized as incest. And when the human race had developed to a stage at which it did not need to be incestuous in order to propagate the race, it was forbidden. We find that at one time a man could marry two sisters, but later this was forbidden. We find in one of the fastest reversals of Revelation that Abraham was commanded to sacrifice his son, but then relieved of the duty. So abrogation is not something that occurred just in the Holy Quran or just in the New Testament or just in the Old Testament. In fact, according to the human condition, Allah adjusted the laws as needed. In the case of alcohol, the Islamic understanding is that mankind was not ready in its earlier stages to accept the prohibition on alcohol, that this would have been too difficult upon them, that they would not have been able to maintain the commandment. It was not until later that the commandment could be given because the people could actually live by that commandment. Hence, that commandment was delayed until the Islamic revelation. Similarly, in the other examples that I mentioned, you can understand the sense for having delayed those prohibitions until the stages of revelation at which they were appropriate. Now, it is odd to hear objections from the Christian quarter in this regard. Why? Well, because Jesus Christ is recorded in Matthew as having stated that he did not come to destroy the prophets or the law, but to fulfill. And he went on to say that not one jot not one till shall change from the law until all be fulfilled. He went on to clarify till heaven and earth shall pass, etc., etc. The Christian claim is that the law is canceled by the concept of justification by faith. So we have Christians claiming that they cannot accept the fact that Islamic law abrogates some of their laws, but on the other hand, the Christians abrogated the entire Mosaic law with their concept of justification by faith. Whereas Jesus Christ taught Old Testament law, he was known for this as Rabbi Jesus. He was an Orthodox Jew. That was the code he lived by. That was the law he professed in multiple passages in the New Testament. The fact is that Jews have abrogated not part of Old Testament law, but all of it. And yet they have a problem with the Holy Quran abrogating the law regarding alcohol. It's a very disingenuous claim. At the same time, Christians effectively argue that not just the law changed, but the essence of God himself, that God transformed from the wrathful God of the Old Testament to the merciful God of the New Testament. So the claim is basically, you claim that alcohol is forbidden? Well, that's just ridiculous. Okay, we have changed the essence and nature of God, and we have canceled all previous laws, but we can't believe that just this one law has been abrogated. That is a pretty insincere thing to say. So we can easily understand that there may have been a few changes in the laws. The restrictions of the Sabbath might have been lifted. The permissibility of alcohol might have been annulled. But for the most part, we find that the laws of the Old Testament are intact through the course of the teachings of Moses, the teachings of Jesus Christ, and the teachings and revelation that was transmitted by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa In the same way, we find that the creed has not changed. As the Old Testament declared in the first commandment that know your God is one God, Jesus Christ taught the same message three places in the New Testament, that your God is one God, and the Holy Quran declares divine unity. Not only declares divine unity, but condemns the Trinity. So we find preservation of the message of the prophets, okay? 
not of the doctrines. And it's important to understand the difference because different churches have corrupted the doctrines of Christianity to pattern their doctrines after the teachings, not of Jesus Christ, but the teachings of Paul. And we have discussed this in previous... So, what do we find in that case? We find that the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did not cancel or change the creed of the Jews or the Christians, but rather maintained it. Now, what is important about this is that he did not compromise the creed according to the teachings of Jesus Christ to satisfy those who had already compromised it. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is although he maintained the true teachings of previous prophets, teaching that God is one, as Moses and Jesus taught, this was not what most Christians at the time believed. Most Christians at the time believed in the Trinity. Remember, this was 640, 650, 660 CE, whereas the Trinity had been canonized in 325. So many Christians, if not most, were believing in the Trinity. They were professing mysteries of faith. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam transmitted a revelation which supported the true teachings of Jesus Christ, not the corruptions of the doctrines that have been derived by the Trinitarian Church. Now, that is significant why? That is significant because a false prophet would have been seeking to build up a congregation. And how do you build up a congregation? You give them what they want. You give them more of what they already have. They are believing that God is one but three in one. You tell them the same thing. They are believing that Christ will return. You tell them that you are Christ returned. All of these things, you give them what they want. You don't give them what you want. What is the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He gave them what God wanted. He gave them what had been revealed to Moses. He gave them what had been revealed to Jesus. And he gave them a revelation that supported the creed that had been revealed to those previous prophets. Yes, there were some abrogations in the law, but they were few and far between. And the bottom line is that a charlatan would have built up his congregation not by giving a revelation that is contrary to what people believe, not by correcting people, but by giving them what they want. What do we expect from the example of a true prophet? We expect a true prophet to correct deficiencies, correct matters in which people have gone astray, and guide them back to the religion of Allah's design. And that is the example we find in the person of Muhammad, peace be upon him. So, let us remember the story in Matthew 22:14 that concludes with the teaching, for many are calling, but few are chosen. We find that many are exposed to these truths, but few embrace them. In one case, I would like to quote from how the Muslims represented their faith to the king of Abyssinia, a Christian king, who inquired after their beliefs. They stated as follows, quote, O king of Abyssinia, we used to be a people of ignorance, worshiping idols, eating dead animals, performing indecencies, casting off family bonds, doing evil to our neighbors, and the strong among us would eat the weak. Thus remained our common trait until God sent us a messenger. We knew his ancestry, his truthfulness, his trustworthiness, and his chastity. He called us to Allah that we might worship him alone and forsake all that which we have been worshiping other than him of these stones and idols. He commanded us to be truthful in speech, to keep our trusts, to strengthen our family ties, to be good to our neighbors, to avoid the prohibitions and blood, and to avoid all indecencies, lying, theft of the orphans' money, and the slander of chaste 
women. He further commanded us to worship Allah alone, not associating anything in worship with him. He commanded us to pray, pay charity, and fast. So we believed in him, accepted his message, and followed him in that which he received from Allah, worshiping Allah alone, not associating any partners with him, refraining from all prohibitions and accepting all that which was made permissible for us. Well, the Christian king of Abyssinia, upon hearing the statement, declared what? Did he declare, gee, we never heard that message before? No. He declared that this was the message of the prophet Jesus Christ, recognizing that Muhammad's revelation and example, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, maintained the true message of Allah, the true message of God. The Christian king of Abyssinia sheltered the Muslims, and the tradition relates that he himself embraced Islam. To conclude, I am going to quote, not from a Muslim source, but from Alphonse de Limartin one of the most famous historians of all time. He stated as follows in speaking of Muhammad, peace be upon him. His life, his meditations, his heroic revilings against the superstitions of his country and his boldness in defying the furies of idolatry, his firmness in enduring them for 15 years at Mecca, his acceptance of the role of public scorn and almost of being a victim of his fellow countrymen, all these and finally his flight, his preaching, his wars against odds, his faith in his success and his superhuman security in misfortune, his forbearance in victory, his ambition, which was entirely devoted to one idea and in no manner striving for an empire, his endless prayers, his mystic conversations with God, his death and his triumph after death, all these attest not to an imposture, but to a firm conviction which gave him the power to restore, to restore dogma. This dogma was twofold, the unity of God and the immateriality of God, the former telling us what God is the latter telling what God is not. The one overturning, overthrowing false gods with the sword, the other starting an idea with the words. Philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, restorer of rational dogmas, of a cult without images, the founder of 20 terrestrial empires and of one spiritual empire, that is Muhammad. As regards all standards by which human greatness may be measured, we may well ask, is there any man greater than he?